Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I know for some of you it's quite early yet. Uh, my name is Martin. I work for Prime Video. And uh, this talk will be about the profiler that we did uh, to fix performance issues uh, in Prime Video app that's running on living room devices. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the internals of the profiler. I'll rather focus on how to use it, how you can use it, and uh, adapt to your project. Uh, but if you want to know more about internals, uh, I'll be here around till the end of the day. So uh, you can just speak to me uh, anytime you want. So I'll start with explaining why we actually started the new profiler. Because as you might know, there's quite a lot of them on the market already. There's LTTNG, Ftrace, UFTrace, Strace, Perf, and uh, a lot of others. Uh, the thing is that the, the development environment that we had to work in was quite different than what uh, you might get used to. So we've been doing applications on, uh, that's running on the living room devices, such as uh, game consoles, um, smart TVs, streaming sticks. And some of the platforms are very friendly for developers, like game consoles, they are amazing. They provide lots of tools, uh, debugging utilities, and so on. But smart TVs are not that friendly for developers. So very often, all we have is compiler. And we can't really deploy, the, uh, deploy any tool to that, uh, to that device. It's very close. So all we can do is basically deploy a single app. That's our, uh, our Prime Video app. And that's it. So we can't, for example, deploy S-Trace or LTTNG. We can't uh, deploy some kernel modules and so on. So it's a very, very limited environment. And also, uh, our application, the Prime Video application, is, is built using uh, three different languages. So we have a native layer, which is a C++, and then that native layer uh, exposes uh, two uh, scripted engines, one for Lua and one for JavaScript, and we run them uh, at the same time. So they're basically three different languages. And uh, because those platforms, some of those platforms are uh, very low in, in terms of the CPU and memory, um, we had quite a few performance issues, especially on the, cheapers, uh, on the cheaper platforms. And we wanted to debug it. But as I said, there was no much tools for, uh, for debugging. There were some tools, but they didn't really meet our requirements. So we said, OK, maybe we can just quickly prototype something, uh, and we see if that works. And yeah, as you see, this presentation is about the profiler, so it actually worked. Um, so we come up with a list of features that we want to have from our profiler. Uh, this is just a short list, uh, but th there's a, a quite a few more features. I just listed the, the more important. So it's user space and instrumentation based. We basically don't have access to kernel uh, by, by any means. So user space for us was the only option. Instrumentation based, we can't really deploy a second daemon that, I don't know, for example, checks traces every second or so. So everything has to be built in into the application. Uh, since our application is written in C and JavaScript and, uh, and Lua, we decided that we're going to write it in C++ or C. Uh, but it should be available for those languages as well in somehow uh, by providing a bindings layer or so on. Um, also, because we port to different platforms, those platforms are very different to each other. Some of them have different operating systems, different uh, CPUs, even different NDNS. Uh, so it should be easy to port those, uh, this profiler to all the platforms that we support by Prime Video. Uh, low overhead, I think this is uh, something that all the profilers are trying to achieve. Uh, we wanted to measure timings because that's what usually people think of uh, when they do profiling, how long does it take to execute a function. But apart from that, we also wanted to measure other metrics like memory usage, CPU usage, uh, how many HTTP calls we've done, and so on. Um, and the other thing uh, that we wanted to achieve, we, we had a group of people who were very into performance and were responsible for fixing performance issues, but we wanted also other developers to to use profiling tools on a daily basis. So while they're writing the code, they can focus on performance as well, so we don't have to do the job afterwards. So we wanted to provide a consistent user experience across different platforms. So no matter what, uh, uh, what application, what device you're developing on, whether this is a streaming stick, web, uh, game console, smart TV, you always have the same tool. So it's easier. They just need to learn one tool, and they can use it. Uh, for all the different projects. So that was a list of features. And uh, we come up with the very simple high-level design. We have a profile device that's running the application. We have a, 
uh, Hawk Tracer library attached to that, uh, to that application. That generates a, a binary stream of events. We call it HTDump stream. And then we have a client, which is on the developer desktop, that's converting this byte stream to uh, some human readable form, like, uh, for example, Chrome Trace format, flame graphs, or you can, uh, as I'll show you later in the demo, you can build your own, uh, you can build your own client very easily to do some other visualizations that our client doesn't provide. Um, this is a bit more uh, detailed diagram. So there is an app. Uh, this app has the Hope Tracer library linked. Uh, and uh, Hulk Tracer has a timeline. A timeline is essentially a buffer, uh, and application pushes events to this buffer. This buffer, uh, these events are serialized, and then once the buffer is full, uh, we push it to a listener, and the listener could, is basically a function callback, uh, so that then the listener decides what to do. And we, Hulk Tracer by default provides two listeners. It's either it stores the, the, the stream to a file, or it can send it over TCP IP, but you can extend it. Uh, I don't know, if you want to send the stream over a serial port, for example, you can do that. And then the stream uh, goes to the developer desktop, and again, we provide the library uh, it's written in C++ and has Python bindings that deserializes the stream of events and provides you nice data structures in your language. Uh, so then you can build your client. And we already provide the Hog Tracer Converter client that converts this uh, binary stream to some common trace formats. Uh, we also have the library that's written in Rust. It's, it's not really experimental because I know people already use it and uh, I'm going to use it today during the demo. So. If that's going to work, then it won't be experimental anymore. Um, hopefully, it will work. Um, so I mentioned here, you see that there's a, there is a timeline. And the timeline is conceptually is a buffer, but it actually is a little bit more. And you need to provide some configuration uh, for that timeline. And so to simplify this process of creating the timeline, we, uh, Hawk Tracer provides a global timeline, which is quite efficient. It's kind of multiple timelines, actually. It's timeline per thread. So if you push uh, events to, to the timeline, we don't require any locks because it's, uh, you have an instance per thread, so there's no problem with data races and so on. Um, and you can easily access it by just calling htglobaltimeline-get function. Uh, I recommend just using that. To be honest, I don't think in my real projects I ever use different approach. So uh, it's probably good enough. Uh, so I mentioned that. Uh, the basic data you need uh, in Hawk Tracer is an event. Uh, so you can either we have quite a few events defined in Hawk Tracer event types, but you can define your own. Uh, it's basically a C structure. You, defi you define it using a, a C macro, uh, and you provide the, the event class name, uh, which could be my event, for example. It supports inheritance, so all the events must eventually inherit from HT event, which is a very base class. And then you provide a set of, set of fields that you want to have in this event. And you define it by three properties as a, as a type, as either integer, string, struct, float, double, um, or pointer, I think. Um, then you provide the actual C type of that and, and the name. And that converts to the, to the C structure. Uh, and additionally, it generates automatically a few helper methods, like, for example, a method for serializing the event. So when you have this event and you want to push it to, uh, to the byte stream, this macro already will generate uh, a function that does it for you. And then when you already have the event, uh, if you want to push uh, the instance of this event type to the timeline, you just call ht timeline push event macro. Uh, you pass the timeline as a first parameter. The, the second parameter is the name of your function uh, of your uh, event type, and then all the all the values, all the fields, and that's that's pretty much it. Um, so I've, I said that before that uh, we provide the client that parses the the binary stream, but then I said that you can write your own event type. Uh, so you might be wondering how the client knows how to uh, deserialize those new event types. Uh, and for that purpose, we, have the, we divided the event stream into two uh, substreams. There's a metadata stream that describes the, all the types, and there's the actual event stream uh, with all the values. And since everything in Hawk Tracer is uh, an event, even the definition of the event is uh, event as well. So we have special events uh, that describe your type, and the first event is just describing the name and, uh, and the number of fields that you have. And then 
you have each each event new event for each field of this uh, of this class. So in that case, we'll expect one event uh, one event for uh, class info event and three uh, events for class field info event. And in class field info event, we provide information like uh, uh, like the field type, uh, field name, the size of of that field, and uh, and the data type, whether it is a string, integer, a struct, and so on. And this, uh, they bo the bo both streams are serialized as a byte stream. So you can see that basically it's just like 30 or 40, uh, 40 bytes for, uh, for those events. And then eventually you have the actual event. And this event has a type. So it's number 9. As you can see, the, the class ID is 9 here. And the info class ID 9 again. So all of them are kind of connected to each other. By this, uh, by this identifier, and uh, it's important that you first need to send the the definition of the event type before you actually send the first event of this type, because otherwise the parser doesn't know how to how to parse this event. And yeah, uh, but the hook tracer does everything for you, so it's just. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. If if the parser loses sync with, with the byte stream, is is there a way for it to regain sync later? So no, at the moment it's not possible. Uh, I'm working on improvement that it will be actually possible, but at the moment, if you lose the metadata stream, yeah, there's a problem. So, yeah, but uh, I'm aware of this problem and we'll be working on that. Um, okay, uh, so I mentioned that we also want to measure time, mm -hmm. and that was actually quite important requirement for us. So, to make it even easier, uh, we've inter we, predef we have predefined event types that um, that are already for measuring time. They take a label, and they take the duration and the timestamp. And uh, we have a macros that automatically generate those events and push them uh, to the timeline. And so for C++, uh, depending on what you want to do, if you just trace the whole function, you just put the, this macro, uh, ht trace function at the beginning. Uh, and if you just want to trace the random scope, there's HD trace. There is a few more macros that are more optimized uh, for that. They, for example, they have some hash maps, so you don't have to send the, uh, the the string every time for every event. It's even more optimized version that uses uh, some tricks with static thread local uh, objects. So even even hash map is not necessary for some of them. Uh, it's documented, so I don't want to uh, spend much time on that. And um, we did bindings for a few languages. For now, the public one is Python and Rust. Uh, we have one for JavaScript as well. It's not ready yet to be published, but we'll do that in the future. And for Lua as well. Uh, so this is how you do that in Python. You import the trace decorator and you just put it for the function that you want to trace. And the, the same for Rust. Uh, there are some macros. I'm not an author of the of the Rust bindings, so probably if you want to know more about this, uh, this Alexandru, his infos. I'm not sure if he's uh, today in this room, but uh, yeah, he's he's an author of that, and basically that's how you do that. Also, there are some kind of Rust macros uh, that you can trace the scope. Um, okay, so that was it, and uh, I just want to show you some some demos so you can see how you can use it. Um, the first one is. We have a C++ application that allocates the memory, and then we want to we want to see on the graph how the memory grows. We also want to know how many allocations we've done in this program. Uh, so we'll write a simple Python client that receives the hog tracer event stream and uh, does the visualization. And I start with the with the program itself. Uh, so at the very beginning, we need to initialize the hog tracer library. And then, um, so this is the event that we event type that we define. As I said, there's a name, uh, the base type, and we have two fields: memory usage and allocation count. They both are integers, uh, size t a type. Um, and the event uh, before you want to use it, you need to register it. This method is auto generated by uh, by the macro that I showed before, by this macro, HT declare event type. Um, you just need to call it before you use it. Uh, it registers uh, some information in the Tracer system. And then you create a listener to the timeline. Uh, I said the global timeline is the best option. So we're using global timeline here. There are some parameters like port, uh, 
this is the buffer size. We set it to zero, so we'll get, we don't actually buffer anything. We stream it directly uh, to the client, and we say that we want to use it, uh, we want to use TCP uh, client so we can stream it uh, directly to the client and we can get the real data. Um, Hawk Tracer already provides the functions to get uh, the memory usage. It also provides some functions to trace the allocation. Uh, so you just need to provide uh, a callback. This is for malloc, pre-malloc, then it's post-malloc, pre-realloc, post-realloc, and so on and so on. We are only interested in pre-malloc uh, hooks, so we re register that. And um, this is basically our function. Uh, we get the memory usage. Uh, we get the, the allocation count, which is read uh, in the other callback, so here. This is our malloc callback, so we increase the allocation count every time uh, somebody calls malloc. Uh, so we get that all in the context object, uh, and that's, that's basically what we do. We push the event. Uh, so this is our type, those are uh, our values, and this is, the, yeah, this is the memory usage, virtual memory usage, and this is the allocation count. And this is the client, it's written in Python. Um, all we need to do, we need to start the client uh, the Hawk Tracer client, we say, okay, uh, listen to 8765 port uh, on this IP address. Um, this is the animate method. That's basically the anim that does the drawing the graph. But the most interesting bit is this one. So this is basically how we read events from Hawk Tracer. Um, this is our client. So we're waiting uh, for end of stream. If it's not, then we pull an event. If there is an event in the queue, uh, we check. The, the, the first, this is a tuple, and the first element of the tuple is the event name, so we check if this is the event that we want. And if so, uh, we get the timestamp, we get the allocation count, and we get the memory usage. And then we put the memory usage on the graph, and we print the allocation count. Um, so it's very, very simple. Uh, let's run it. Um, so we run the client, and now we run uh, the program that we want to trace. So you can see that uh, the memory usage is growing, and you can also see the allocation count is, is going up. And so you might be wondering why the memory usage is growing. If we go back to our application, we see that we have a loop, and we do malloc. Uh, so, and it's called um, 100,000 uh, times, so we can see how many mallocs we actually got. It's more than 100,000. So there's probably some other allocations going on. Um, yeah, and this, is the, and this is the graph. So that's how you can get the real data from the Hawk Tracer by defining your own event. It, could be, it doesn't have to be memory usage. You, for example, can trace the uh, number of uh, HTTP calls, for example, and so on. Um, yeah, so that was the first demo. And the second one is going to be more complex a little. I want to show you how you can trace um, multiple languages at the same time, because that was our actually our real use case. We had application written in C++, and then we run Lua and JavaScript on top of that. Uh, so I do a slightly different example. I have uh, a main application written in Rust. Uh, this application downloads the image using uh, a downloader library that's written in C. Uh, it uses curl. Uh, and then I rotate this image uh, using uh, some image, uh, I think it's OpenCV, maybe not OpenCV, I actually changed it. But yeah, it rotates the image in Python, so I run Python uh, interpreter in Rust. Uh, and then at the same time, while I'm rotating the image, I also upload the image that I downloaded in the first step to, to the S3 backend. And I want to know how much time I spend in each particular, um, uh, op in each particular operation. So. I, again, start with the code. So this is our Rust client. Uh, even though you're not, you might not be familiar with Rust, I think it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, so we start with download file. This is download file RS. It's basically just the wrapper for the download file library uh, f function from the library that's written in C. Um, then once we have the file downloaded, we spawn two threads. One is doing the rotation in Python. It starts the Python interpreter and does the rotation. And the other one, at the same time, uploads, uh, uploads the file uh, to S3. You might see that all of the functions here 
are decorated with, uh, with those macros, and we also have some other trace points in here. We can look at the downloader file. It's a pretty simple one. It's just the curl wrapped around. Um, we trace the function here at the beginning, and we also uh, see how long does it take to, to call curl easy perform. So we trace the whole scope here. And just last bit is the Python one. Uh, we import the, the decorator and we uh, decorate all the functions. So we basically rotate the image uh, and save the image. We load the image, we rotate the image, and then we save the image to the file. So not, not really a rocket science here. It's important that if you want to run it with Python, this environmental variable needs to be set. Otherwise, uh, the Python bypasses all the all the trace decorators, so it's actually it doesn't have much impact on the memo, uh, on the performance if you disable that. So you can even have it in the production code. Um, okay, so let's run this. Um, so this is our program. It downloaded the file successfully. It's doing the rotation and it's doing the upload. So you can see that it actually did rotate uh, some image. Let's start uh, three from zero. Yes, yeah, so as a hawk, and it's basically all the all the angles are here. Uh, if we delete that one, we have also rotate htdump, which is the binary file uh, with all the events, all the traces. Um, oh, this is not going to work because I forgot the I forgot this uh, environment variable here, so we wouldn't have the Python traces. So I run it again. Um, I'm going to delete the images. So we have the, the htdump file, which is the binary stream. Uh, we can now use uh, Hope Tracer Converter. This is the one that's experimental, so hope it's working. And we generate the Chrome Trace format, so we say it will be output.json. Okay, it converted, so now you can use the tool that's deployed with, uh, with Chromium, and you see that, first you see that we have three threads here, one, two, three, and that's exactly what we had, because we had the main thread, and then we spawned two, sec uh, two extra threads for, uh, for rotate and for upload. This is the first bit that's in C++ uh, or C. We download the file, there's a HTTP request, and then just after that we, rota we start rotating Python, and those trace points here, those are from Python, save image, rotate, main, those trace points are from Python, and this one, uh, upload to S3, is in Rust. Um, so, as you can see, you can trace, uh, you can have uh, everything in one trace file, uh, and you can easily analyze what's going on in the program. You can also uh, convert it to uh, flame graphs. So if you want uh, the flame graph view, you can just do that. Uh, this is a very simple program, so the flame graph also is very simple. But yeah, um, so that's it. Um, we have some uh, plan for improving this. Uh, there are some of the items, but not all of them. As you mentioned, uh, we want to add some extra protection layer in case uh, we lose some events on the way. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, there's a bunch of links. Uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, there's a documentation on the website. There are tutorials. Uh, there are, they say how to integrate it with your project. Basically, Hawk Tracer can be uh, combined into one single C++ and header file, so it's easy to uh, to link it to your project if you want. Uh, there are other links for bindings and for for converter. So uh, thank you. I think we'll have one minute for questions, but if that's not enough, then I'll be around. Okay, yeah. Which methods, like you showed TCP now, right? Mm -hmm. So in addition to TCP, what do you currently natively use? So this is the TCP that we used in the first demo, and the file well, which was used at the second demo. Okay. Yeah, so those are natively supported at the moment. Something like serial and you have to use Sorry? 
Yeah, you need to write them on your own. So, oh, sorry, the question was what, uh, what listener types we support. And my answer is so currently we support file and TCP listeners. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.